Hello, everybody, and welcome to Wednesday night. May be wet outside, may be cold, but it sure is warm in here with the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen? Amen. I just got a, a sign on my iPad right here that Solid Rock Church is live tonight on Facebook. <laughs> that's the first time that's come up. I must have something new on this that I don't know about. But welcome again. And we're going to get dig right into the Word tonight, but before we do, let's, let's just pray. Let's, let's just pray tonight, invite. I know you brought the Holy Spirit because Jesus is here. Uh, he said where the two or more gathered in His name, He is here. He is here. He is here. So, Father God, in the name of Jesus, we come to you tonight. We glorify you, Father. We thank you, Lord God, for the triumphal entry. We thank you, Father, for the Passover. We thank you, God, that Resurrection Sunday is coming. Sundays are coming. And, Lord God, that that day, on that Easter Sunday morning, God, uh, that Resurrection Sunday morning, Father, the stone couldn't hold him back. Oh, the devil couldn't hold him back. And death, hell, and the grave couldn't hold him back. But you came out of that grave, Lord Jesus Christ, to give us resurrection life. And we thank you tonight, Father, in the name of Jesus for your amazing grace that we now have received, that we once was lost, but now that we've been found and we've been empowered by your grace, your empowering presence upon our life to be all and to do all in this life what you have destined us to do. In Jesus' name, we glorify you tonight, Father. Amen and amen. 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 Well, uh, this is a continuation of the series of the Believer's Authority, but tonight I'm, I'm titling this a little bit something different. I'm not dead, I'm alive, and God is living on the inside of me. You remember the movie, God's Not Dead, He's Alive, He's Living on the Inside, and it was sung by the group, uh, what was the name of the group? Anybody remember the name of the group? I went, yeah, 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 the Newsboys. Anyway, great song, great movie, but tonight, I want you to realize you're not dead. You're alive. And Jesus Christ, through the power of the Holy Spirit, is living on the inside. We're not dead people. We're alive. And we bring the fruit of the Spirit and the gifts of the Spirit to the people in this world that needs the love of Jesus. Amen. And something that's amazing to me, as you minister the love of God to other people, it does something for you. Can I get a witness out here? It get, it, when you share your faith or encouragement to someone else, uh, or give them a hand up, a lift up, uh, or, or, or a good work, or a, or, a, or a kind word, or a good deed, uh, it not only blesses those people, but in my life, as I look back and recount the, the many years of my walk with the Lord Jesus Christ, that I find myself fulfilled and encouraged and, and built up. And, and I love who I am in Christ when I'm doing the things that Jesus has called me to do. It's like when you're living your purpose, it's impossible to be unhappy. It's impossible to be depressed when you're living your purpose in Jesus Christ. Can I get an amen if you believe that? I mean, it's the truth. So out of that giving to someone else, and I'm not talking about, you know, money or material things. I'm talking about the love of God. When you give, build up and edify and minister grace to someone else, it not only helps them tremendously, and, and matter of fact, it can minister the gospel and bring somebody into deliverance and, and into, into salvation and add them to the kingdom of God. But at the same time as you're helping and not realizing, but it's helping you. It helps you. It works both ways. But I'm not dead. I'm alive. And God, through the power of the Holy Spirit, is living on the inside. If we could just get that. That I'm not dead. I am alive. And Jesus Christ is living on the inside. And that goes for every one of us that's been born of the Spirit of God. 
Well, in the book of Colossians, starting at verse 13, listen to what the Word of God says. You once were dead because of your sins. You once was dead because of your sins. But you're not a sinner anymore. Because Paul said you was once dead. Because of your sins and because of your sinful nature was not yet cut away. Well, if, it, if you once were a sinner because of your sins and you was born into iniquity and sin because of your sinful nature and Paul is defining this that it was not cut away at that time. But see, when you believed and received simply by faith in Jesus Christ and the grace of God, you were made alive. And sin, the, the scripture says, then God made you alive. You're not dead. You're not dead. There was a cutting away of your sinful nature. So if there's been a cutting away by the power of God and the work of God in your life and you've received the heart of Jesus Christ and God put a right spirit in you, your spirit came alive and the old sinful nature is cut away forever. So a, a lot may ask me then, Pastor Benny, why do I struggle in my mind? Is because we renew our mind with the power of the Word of God. Amen. See, then God made you alive with Christ. With Christ because Christ is in you now. If you've been born of the Spirit of God and He forgave you of all your sins. Therefore, you are not a sinner anymore that is saved by grace. No, you once were a sinner, but you have been made alive and quickened the moment that you believed and received God's free gift of grace. And now you are alive in Christ Jesus. Now listen to this, made alive. Uh, I'm reading that, I think, from the New Living Translation. Yes, New Living Translation. But listen, the King James says... You, uh, God made you alive. The word there is quickened in the King James Version. Listen to what that means. I love these word studies. It goes deep. It's refreshing. Uh, quickened or made alive. It means this. That meaning to produce. God has produced something in you. So you're worth it. You are valuable to God. He has produced something. He has made you alive. He begat you as in birthing a newborn baby. <laughs> so actually, I was really born as a newborn baby. Even though I was 20 years old, I was born again as a newborn baby. Just as you, whenever you was born of the Spirit of God... I was 20 years old, yet I was a brand new creation, a brand new baby. Listen to this. Made alive or quickened also means to cause to live. There's a cause to live. He's given you the power to live this life now. You lack nothing. He's given you life. This made alive or quickened means you've been given the life of God himself. The spiritual power to arouse and invigorate you. To give you strength and energy to you to increase life. Not only in the spiritual realm. But also of the physical realm. And it also means to be endued with new and greater powers in this life. Amen. I got one amen out of that. That is just amazing to me. So how in the world would that being said, when you are born of the Spirit of God, God is living on the inside, there's been a cutting away. You would no longer have a sinful nature. So you're not a sinner. Amen. And then you have the power of God. Of all this deepness of what that power is living inside of you. How in the world could we ever confess that we're weak and we can't make it? And there's been so many things in my life that has deterred me from this and that and the other. The moment that we believe and receive what God has given, even though sometimes when we've been born again, it takes a while and a process of time to process this in our mind. 
because of the emotional damage that might have been done in our past as a child or whatever circumstances happened. But the moment that we renew our mind that the Word of God is true and it's true for me and that's who I am in Christ and realize the power of God that is within us, it changes perspective about everything about mine and your life. Amen? Amen. So listen to this. In verse 14 in Colossians 2, He canceled the record of the charges against us. Because of what Jesus did at Calvary and through the, the, the death, burial, and resurrection, He canceled the record. There was a record. It wasn't a gold or a silver it was probably a black record, you know, against you and I. But Jesus counseled the record of the charges that was against all of us. And he took it away and he nailed it to his cross. So if you can imagine, there was a record on you as a sinner. As someone that was lost. But now you've been found. And God is living inside of you. And you're not your old nature self. You have a spiritual nature now, which you have the character of God. And our only process here is to access that character through the Spirit of God that lives inside of you. And see, there is no charges against you, none. By Jesus being crucified and nailing the charges to the cross, you have been justified just as though you have never sinned in your life. And His grace is even more abundantly and above and far above what you can ever imagine that still covers sin, past, present, and if you were to fall, even in the future, you can get back up. Amen. And that grace and blood of the Lord covers you. He nailed it to the cross. There's no charges. There's no charges. And I love the, the verse in Isaiah that says that God doesn't even remember. So why would you bring it up again? I'm going to tell you why you would bring it up again. It's either one or two things. The mind re needs to be renewed the way you think about yourself. And also the devil will con continually accuse you in your mind. You've got to accept this fact that the devil is stripped of his authority. He's a defeated foe. But you have to invoke the power and authority that God has given you by speaking the word of God when you're attacked. The devil's always going to lie to you. He's always going to tell you that you're not going to make it, that you're weak, you're not strong, you're not who God says that you are. But when you begin to speak who God says that you are, there's all, that, that's how you access the Holy Spirit power within you. I love who I am in Christ. God wants you to love yourself. And that's not self-centeredness. No, that's when self-centeredness is crucified. However, like Paul said, I'm crucified with Christ. What he's saying is the old man of who I used to be is dead. He doesn't live any longer. I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. And the life that I live now in this body, I live to the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. It's amazing to me. Listen how he did it. In this way, this is how he did it. Verse 15. He disarmed the spiritual rulers and authorities. He shamed them publicly. In other words, the enemy and the demonic forces have been disarmed. Let me, let me say it to you like this in Winston County terms. The only the power the devil has in your life is what you allow him to have. Before Jesus did what he did, the devil had... The keys, the keys, he held the keys of death, hell in the grave, and he, and he had authority on the earth. But he does not have that authority even though, even, anymore, even though he's our adversary and he hates us. He can only do to you to the extent that you believe the lie. That you believe the lie. So in this way, he, Jesus, disarmed the spiritual rulers and authority by doing what? He nailed it to the cross. 
He shamed them publicly by his victory over them on the cross. He did it on the cross. You see, Satan was defeated at the cross and through the resurrection of Jesus. The resurrection of Jesus. The enemy, our adversary, is a defeated foe. We need to get that projection in our mind that the devil is a defeated foe. When he attacks you with his wild schemes and fiery darts, and again, I've, I've taught that here ever since I've been pastor here, the wild schemes and fiery darts of the enemy is only thought projected lies into your mind, into your mind, which will affect your emotions. They're only thought projection of lies in your mind. You see, the Word of God, by believing it and speaking it, and do not let the enemy ever, denom- ever dominate you again if you speak the Word. For example, I carry this, and I wasn't going to do this, but I'm going to get it out now. Okay? It's like when I'm sick. Okay? Pastor Benny, you just said something was negative. No. I'm dealing with in this life, God give you five senses. But there's also the senses of the Spirit that trumps our five senses. I'm not going to lie and say when I'm sick that I'm not sick. But what I do is I don't give, I, I don't give strength to that sickness by just keep saying, you know, because have you ever noticed this? How powerful this is. And as a medical person and as a patient, I noticed this. Is that when you keep speaking, it may be, and you know, say for example, you know, you've got a cold or something like that or sinusitis or or, uh, uh, whatever it is. And you keep speaking life to that by saying how bad you feel. Now, well, the fact is, I don't feel so good, you know, when I've got a cold or whether it's a sinus infection or whatever, I don't feel good. I don't. And and how how many of you have ever experienced this and you just keep talking that way and not realizing what you say? And I, and you and you it, you can get worse. It doesn't mean that that the symptoms or anything is either any better or any worse, but you can feel worse. By speaking life to that, by speaking death. Because death in a life is in the power of your tongue. And you keep speaking to it. But when I'm sick, I've noticed this. That now, what I do, I don't deny the sickness, but I begin to speak God's Word into that. Just like when the enemy attacks you, whether it be with sickness, with emotional uh, injuries or hurts or thoughts, or the lies of the enemy comes in, or whatever thing is upsetting you, or like a sickness, uh, the Lord's Word, then I begin to take these scriptures out, and I keep these in my Bible all the time. And, I, and it's like God's Word says, Psalms 41, 3, says, I'm going to speak this, Father. Now, I don't have all these verses memorized, and it's not unspiritual if you don't. It'd be a good thing to, to learn a few, but it's nothing wrong, and it's not unspiritual to take out God's word and to read it into it and speak it. See, when you read it, you believe it in your heart, you go to speak it out of your mouth. So Father, I believe this in Jesus' name. Your promise is I I will strengthen you. So I'm strengthened on my bed of languishing and I will turn all of your bed, uh, I will turn uh, all of this around, saith the Lord. I will deliver you. I am the health of your countenance and I'm your God. So Father God, uh, no plague shall come near my dwelling. This plague has to go because you promised you will deliver us of all of our infirmities in Jesus' name. I will heal your broken heart. I will bind up your wounds. Trusting me, the Lord says, brings health to your navel and marrow to your bones. My words are life to you. Listen to this. My words. What is that? The word of God. My words are life to you and health and medicine to all of your flesh. So, Father, I thank you that your word is life and health. To all of my flesh, no matter what's wrong with me, I'm going to keep speaking the Word of God. And it's amazing how immediately, even when I had COVID-19, when I began speaking, uh, a pastor down from the ramp 
He called me. He said, I noticed that you, you've got COVID-19. Let me tell you how God healed me. And he began to tell me some scriptures. That, and he shared those with me by text message. And I began to pray those scriptures. Not that it was a magic formula, but it was my faith in God's Word. And all of a sudden, I started feeling much, much better. And then, I mean, it, it was not long after that 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 I was completely made whole. And I didn't have a lot of these terrible symptoms that a lot of other people did. And I'm not saying that uh, bad about anyone. I'm just saying that speaking the Word of God by believing it, receiving it in our heart, not letting the enemy nor any of his assignments dominate you, you have to overcome the enemy by the Word of God. Amen? You see? And also... When you struggle, like when I, I do at, at, at times uh, because of my past, even though my past is gone, it's already been bought, it's bought and paid for, and I'm not the same person uh, anymore. And, and I get out my little paper here, my true identity in Christ. There's no telling how many times I had to run to this. And there's no telling how many times I've come into this altar in the morning before I started work here. And I just pour myself out in this altar before God. And I, and, and I would just get my list out. And, and, and I would just, uh, Father God, in the name of the Lord Jesus, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, I decree and declare that I'm yours today. That I'm blood bought. That you saved me, Lord Jesus. You gave me the Holy Spirit. And Lord Lord, the enemy is attacking me in my mind. I bind the works of the enemy right now and I cast them out in Jesus' name. And then here's what works. Then all of a sudden, I begin to rise up that standard that's within me, which is the Word of God through the power of the Holy Spirit. And I begin to confess, I am faithful. I am your child, Father. I've been justified. I'm Christ's friend. I belong to you. I'm a member of your body, Lord God. I'm assured that all things are working together for the good for me. I've been established. I'm anointed. I'm sealed by God. I'm confident that God will perfect the work that he began in me. I'm a citizen of heaven. I'm hidden in Christ. I've not been given the spirit of fear, but a power, love, and a sound mind. I'm born of God. Now get this one. I am born of God and the evil one, the devil, cannot touch me. That's what it says. I mean, turn to, that's in 1 John 5 and 18. Okay, he's my adversary. But the word of God says, I am born of God and the evil one cannot touch me. Why? It's because I believe the word. I speak the word. I stand on the word. I pers- uh, uh, I, I'm tenacious about just standing. And when I've done all else I can do, I'm going to stand and persevere on the word of God. Because I'm going to tell you, sometimes... Your faith is going to be tested because God is not going to tempt you. The devil will tempt you to sin. But God Almighty is going to test your faith because He loves you. And it's all about maturing you into the image of Jesus, Jesus, the Son of God. And that you're already a son and daughter of God so that you can image Him to the world. And that you don't have to go around You know, suffering in this life, you know, being in the mother grubs or being down and depressed. That's what the devil wants us to do and to be in this life and be of no effect. And no matter what your situation is, I'm going to tell you, I I need to speak this out. God says tonight that some of you that I'm speaking to tonight and those that are watching via uh, Facebook tonight, you're coming out. You're coming out of whatever situation it is. And whatever the devil has had a hold in your mind, you're coming out. God is restoring you. You don't have to understand it, but God is healing you right now. He's restoring you right now. Amen? Truth is, through Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, the second you believed and received, when Jesus rose from the dead, you rose with Him. It's like years ago when a pastor preached that to me or say that to me, I'm like, are you nuts? I didn't feel like I was. How is that possible? Well, spiritually and positionally, because of what Jesus did, you're in Christ. And the moment that you believed and received, when Jesus rose from the dead, 
You rose from the dead, just like when you were born again of the Spirit of God. See, Jesus paid for all time everything for salvation and gave His grace for all time to every person that would ever live in the past, present, and in the future. It was already given. Uh, People were not guilty anymore. God was not counting their sins against them at the moment that they received what had been appropriated at Calvary's cross and through the death, burial, and resurrection. So, in the same way, see, Jesus, it was, was 2,000 years ago when I was born again of the, of the Spirit of God. But that was in 1973. But Jesus, about 2,000 years before that, He appropriated that for me. So, I was born again and received what He did 2,000 years ago. In the same way, The second you believe and receive, and when Jesus rose from the dead, you rose with him and have newness of life now, which is resurrection life. You have newness of life, which is resurrection life. You have newness of life, which is resurrection life in this life. And a guarantee that the body, if the Lord tarries and you go to a grave one day, your spirit will go to God who gave it. Ecclesiastes 12 and 11. And, and also in 2 Corinthians 5 and 7, to be absent from this body is to be present with the Lord. That's your spirit, which is the true self. But there's also a promise which you can count on because it's the truth in God's word that there's also going to be a resurrection of a body that was planted in a grave one day. Amen? And you get a brand new body, one just like the Lord's. So... <coughs> Romans 6 and 4, listen to the Word of God. Therefore, you, are we, were buried with Him through baptism and to death. That just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so, you, are, you and I should also walk in newness of life. What in the world? You see, the old you is dead and does not exist anymore. What, your walk now is putting on Christ daily How do you do that? By believing who you are in Christ and by believing the Word of God and knowing that Jesus is all your all in all by believing and speaking the Word of God. Is anybody getting this tonight? Amen? You see, when Jesus sat down at the Father's right hand, that's the place of authority. You positionally sat there with Him. Right now. So you have God's authority and approval to use that authority and the power from heaven that backs that authority and also the power of the Holy Spirit inside of you that will enforce that authority. But you have to access it. And how do you do that? By your faith. And faith is not, well, I hope so. It's a, I know so because it's based on facts of God's Word. Now listen to the Apostle Paul in Ephesians chapter 2, starting at verse 1. And His fullness, His fullness fills you. I could just stop on that tonight. His fullness fills you. So the next time you feel worthless, your life has passed you by, and that you don't have purpose... And as our English-speaking people say, you're in the mully grubs. You feel deficient. You feel down. And I'm not trying to say these words to cause anybody to feel that way. But remember the Word of God. Jesus' fullness has filled you. So do you lack anything? His fullness fills me. So I have no excuse To say some of the things at times that I say about myself. That man I wished I was. And I wish I was like. Don't ever compare yourself with anybody else. It's the devil's plan. To get you to look at somebody else. That they're more spiritual than you. And if the truth is known. They're going through some of the same stuff that you're going through. They're just handling it better. Either they're handling it better. Or they're covering it up real good. Okay. One of the two. I mean, let's just be honest here. 
Well, I don't want to cover up anything that I feel that I'm weak in. No, what do I do? I want to trust God at His Word and live by faith. See, those that believe in God must believe that He is God and He is a rewarder of those that diligently seek Him and that the only way that we please our Father in Heaven is by faith in Him. Why? It pleases God to see us prosper and be in good health and to have His blessings of life. And they only come by one way, and that is through our faith in Him. Amen? And His Word. See, and His fullness fills you. Even though you were once like corpses, dead in your sins and offenses. Well, it says if you were once like that, then you're not like that anymore. You're not, you're not dead anymore. You're, you're not a corpse anymore. You're not dead in sins and offenses anymore. You're not. Jesus took that. And I mean, it is like past, present, and future. I'm not dead. I'm alive. And God is living on the inside. I'm not a corpse. I'm not dead in sin and offenses. That's not me. That's not who I am. It was not. Now listen to what Paul said. Now he's, he's preaching here and teaching through the power of the Holy Spirit to other believers at Ephesus. It wasn't that long ago that you lived in the religion. I want you to catch this. It wasn't that long ago that you lived in the religion. He's talking about Judaism and the law. You lived in the customs and, and all, all, not only were you religious, not only did you live in the customs of the law, but you also lived in the customs and the values of this world. <coughs> How many know that you can be religious and even go through some of the customs of the religious church and also maintain customs and the influence of the culture around us and practice the values of the world. <clears throat> and people that do that are living in darkness. Listen to what the apostle says. You're obeying the dark ruler of the earthly realm who fills the atmosphere with his authority. But we're talking about our authority, our God-given authority. So the dark ruler of the earthly realm has deceived people and blinded people even to a religious custom and values of the world that, hey, I'm okay, you're okay, everybody's okay, when everybody ain't okay. Because the only way you get okay is receiving what was appropriated for you at Calvary's cross and through the resurrection of Jesus. And, and, and see... The dark ruler of the earthly realm who fills the atmosphere with his authority. You see, well, let me finish that verse. And works diligently in the hearts of those who are disobedient to the truth. So the only way that, you can, that a person can continue to live in a, in, in, under the dark ruler and live in darkness is to reject the truth of God's word and who God says that they are. In his word and what's been appropriated for you. You see, mine and your purpose here is to change that atmosphere. See, the devil, the devil is the dark ruler of the earthly realm who fills the atmosphere with his authority. Well, listen, the Bible says that Satan's been stripped of his authority. He don't have that authority anymore. So, mine and your purpose here is to enforce our authority. Amen. And how do you do that? Through the faith in God's word, believing it, decreeing and declaring it, and living it daily in your life. Can somebody say amen if you believe that? See, the corruption, verse 3 of Ephesians 2 says, The corruption that was in us from birth was expressed through the deeds and desires of our self-life. We live by whatever Natural cravings and thoughts our minds dictated to us, living as rebellious children subject to God's wrath like everybody. Paul's trying to make several points here. 
Sometimes we have to be reminded. We have to remind ourselves. I used to be like that. But I'm not like that anymore. And the devil's trying to make me think. Because I may have had a bad thought. Or a bad day. That I must be like that again. And that's not true. But God. But but. Paul here is trying to make a twofold expression here of the truth of God. He's trying to say, get this in verse 4, that even though you used to be like that, I want to tell you about how deep God's love was you even when you were like that. Then he says in verse 4, but God still loved us with such great love. He is so rich in compassion and, and mercy. Even when we were dead and doomed in our many sins, He united us into the very life of Christ. <laughs> oh, Jesus. Even when we were dead and doomed in our many sins, He united us in the very life of Christ. And saved us by his wonderful grace. He raised us up with Christ. The exalted one. And we ascended with him. To, with him. Into the glorious perfection and authority. Of the heavenly realm. For we are now co-seated as one with Christ. I mean, that's amazing to me. I'm seated with Christ. You're seated with Christ. He's raised you up. You're no longer the same. And even though you were dead in trespasses and sin, God loved you then as much as He loves you now. But you've been raised up with Christ the moment you believed and received the gospel of Jesus through the death, burial, and resurrection. Throughout the coming ages, verse 7, we will be the visible display of the infinite, limitless, Limitless riches of His grace and kindness which was showered upon us in Jesus Christ. You see, our purpose here through our authority here is to be a visible display of the kindness and the grace of what was showered upon you and I. Isn't that amazing? <clears throat> you know, I love testimonies. And I've been reading and the uh, Alcoholics Anonymous book. Uh, it's, it's called The Big Book. Amazing stories of how that people that could not help themselves, that were so addicted to alcohol, and I'm talking about some very wealthy people that struggled with alcoholism, and it, in reading these stories, it was a nightmare to be a multimillionaire. I believe one of, his, one of them I read about was Bill, which was co-founder of AA. And this was back during the 30s, and he, he lost everything. And it was amazing to me how that one of his friends came, one of his long-term friends that he hadn't seen in many, many years and he came and he told him, because religion back during the 20s and the 30s meant something different than it meant now. When you told somebody you got religion, it meant that you've been born again of the Spirit of God. It wasn't like what we think religion is now, which has a negative connotation. But this, his friend came and he said, I need to talk to you. He said, I got religion. And of course, automatically, Bill had these images of of what he thought religion and God was about. And then not long after that, his friend continued to contact him, to come see him. And because of his changed life, and because he was the visible display of the power of a changed life by Jesus Christ, Bill came to the end of himself. And realized, I'm powerless. I'm powerless to overcome this. I am. So I surrender my will to the only one that can help me. And he did. I mean, I'm not quoting. I wish I, I started to bring the book in here tonight. And I might do it next week and read it to you. It was just phenomenal. And Bill was saying... He came to the end of himself and realized 
how that he had become a self-centered person. And of course, there was a lot of other things that happened in his life that brought him to that place. But his sole dependency upon allowing God to do for him what he could never do or overcome for himself changed his life forever and changed thousands upon thousands upon thousands of men and women's life through AA, a wonderful organization. And the big book is filled with testimonies how that God had saved and delivered so many people that could not help themselves, that they surrendered, and how that Jesus Christ has saved and delivered them. I wanted to share that because I, re I was remembered of the visible display of Bill's friend that came and basically, see how important that you are the body of Christ and you need to exercise your authority by also sharing your experience. You see, there's no better display of a visible representation of Jesus than for you to go to somebody and say, I've walked in your shoes. And let me tell you how and who got me out of the mess that I was in. And that I'm absolutely a brand new person. And this is what I did. Did you know if we would do that as a whole, if we would be looking for people and our friends and family to say, you know, I was once like that or I was in this problem. I've walked in your same shoes that you're walking through now. But let me tell you what God did for me. And he will do that for you. Amen. Amen. And Ephesians 2.8, for it was only through this wonderful grace that we believed in him. Did you know that God gave you the grace to believe in him? <laughs> That's how powerful and deep that grace is. I mean, if we ever get this, is that God's amazing grace is not on our account of doing anything. <laughs> he gave us the grace to believe. And we didn't go after God. He came after us. He really did. And through this wonderful grace that we believed in Him. And listen to this. God's grace sought you and I out and threw you into His life and pulled you out of darkness into Jesus. Nothing you or I ever did could ever earn this salvation and this grace. For it was the gracious gift of God that brought us to Jesus Christ. And verse 9 says, so no one will ever be able to boast for salvation is Never a reward for good works or human striving. Wow. I want to read that again. <clears throat> Salvation is never a reward for good works or human striving. How many times do we strive to do something? To be acceptable and loved. There's no greater love and acceptance, first and foremost, to know that God loves you and accepts you just as you are. You're already acceptable to God. And get this, even while you were still in your sin. I know that would be hard for some of the religious folks to wrap their head around that. And I'm not meaning that in an ugly way. Because there's a performance of religion that teaches that we've got to do something. When we do accept the provision that was given, you can't help but to want to give out of the same heart that Jesus gave to you. It's the proof that, that God is living in you. That you're alive and you're not dead on the inside. There's something that will drive you. There's something that will drive you, but it won't strive you. There's a difference 
and the Spirit driving you and you striving. Drive, being driven by the Spirit will cause joy, peace, and righteousness in your life and great reward. But striving will steal from you and wear you out to the point that you won't want to do this anymore. It's the truth. You, you, you won't want to do it anymore. You'll say, what's the use? This is wearing me out. Well, God is trying to say, <coughs> your works, <laughs> your good works, and you striving is not why you're here. That'll wear you out. That's religion. That's man's way. That's you trying to perform for me, and you don't have to. I'm the one that did it all. All you got to do is receive that. And then out of that, those good works of the fruit of the Spirit will begin to come out of you as you have chance to share with other people. Amen? I love this verse 10 in Ephesians 2. We have become His poetry or a masterpiece, a master painting. And that's individually, not, not, not only individually, but also corporately. We have become, I'm reading from, I think the, well, I believe I didn't note it on here, but I, I, I'm reading from the Passion Translation. And it says, we have become his poetry, a recreated people. So are you the same anymore? Anybody here feel like they're just the same old, same old? Absolutely not. I'm looking at some beautiful people here tonight. And I can't see you out there, but you're looking pretty good. I'm looking pretty good and kind of styling tonight. My wife gave me a, a new haircut. I didn't get any laughs, but I got a big smile out of my baby tonight. Thank you for giving me a haircut. It was getting pretty ratty. Amen. We have become his poetry, a recreated people that will fulfill the destiny he has given each of us. That is a promise. Did you understand what I just read? Listen to this. Because there's so many people in the body of Christ that don't feel like they have a purpose. I'm too old. Time has passed me by. I'm too young. I'm too old. I'm in middle age life. I'm going through a crisis right now. I got too many of this. I got too many of that going on. Listen to God's promise. We, we are His poetry. We are a recreated people that will. God Almighty is saying that you will fulfill the destiny that I have given each of you. For you are joined to Jesus. And because we are joined to Jesus, we're going to do His will. Which is not a strife. It is a pleasure. It's what gives you life. It will cause people to give their lives for Jesus. It will cause people. I mean, you think about these people that, that experienced and saw Jesus that was raised from the dead. And you've got people out here that's, uh, that's doubting. Well, I don't know about God. I'm studying in, in Buddhism. I'm studying Hinduism. And I'm searching for God and all this kind of stuff. I'm going to give me a break. There ain't none of these religions that has a leader that rose from the dead. I mean, they all got burial places all over the world. But Jesus rose from the dead. I mean, think about doubting Thomas. The doubting Thomas. I ain't going to unless I see the scars in his hand and the place in his side where he was pierced. Well, old Thomas, you know, you read the history on Thomas and old Thomas, he went through some suffering. He went through some torment and he was killed for the sake of the gospel. Listen, if Jesus did not raise from the dead, why in the world would Peter say, hey, listen, listen, I'm going because Jesus told me I was going to be crucified one day, but I don't want to be crucified like my Lord. I'm not worthy to be crucified like the death of my Lord, but you crucify me upside down. Some of them was bold and all, and some filleted alive. Why would these men and women die for a dead Savior? Our Savior lives, praise God, and He lives on the inside of you and I, and we have authority in Him. <clears throat> wow 
and we will fulfill the destiny. You listen to me out there, you, let, you watching tonight and all you in here tonight, you're going to live God's destiny that he has purposed for you to live. You will not part this life until you live God's destiny for you are joined to Christ. You are joined to Christ. I'm going to tell you, just like me, you had to go through some stuff to get where you are today. Because if you hadn't gone through the stuff, you would have probably lost where you are today. But you, it is a great gain for you because of what you've come through or come out of. Amen? Now you got a story. And it's his story that's got to be shared with, you know, if it's only one person or five or ten or fifty or fifty million or fifty thousand You've got a destiny and God says you're going to fulfill that destiny because I've given you one. And because Jesus is in you, you're going to fulfill it. The anointed one. So you're anointed because of the anointed one lives in you. Even before we were born, God planned in advance <coughs> excuse me, our destiny and the good works he would do to fulfill it. That is amazing to me. It's going to happen. It's going to happen because you belong to him. See, please understand that Jesus is entirely dependent, though, upon you and I. His followers to carry out his plans on this earth. You, you are to exercise your authority. You've been given and enforced Jesus' victory over the devil, over demons, over sickness, over storms of life, and physical storms, mountains that you may face, and over the world system. Jesus gave you and I his authority, his power, his name, the word, and nine spiritual gifts. We have everything that we need. We lack nothing. I mean, when we, it changes your life to know I lack nothing. And all my supplies being met by God Himself. Because I seek ye first the kingdom of God. And all these things are just happening into my life. A lot of times bad things happen to God people because you haven't used your authority and enforced God's plan for your lives and for others on the earth. You see, Jesus said in Matthew 6, 10, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. How in the world is that done? Through you and I. We are those broken vessels that the Spirit of God shines through. And the kingdom of God comes through us because Jesus said in Luke 10 and uh, Luke, 7, Luke 17, 21, that the kingdom of God is in you. It's absolutely in you. The kingdom, the spirit of God, Jesus in you. You're not dead, you're alive because God is living on the inside. You see, a believer is not operating in his or her God-given authority when you try to be strong in yourself. See, that's a lot of struggle. It causes strife for you to try to be strong in yourself. But listen what the Word says. The Word says, Ephesians 6, 10, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord, not in yourself. Be strong in the Lord and the power of His might. Be strong in the Lord. You don't have to be strong in yourself. When Jesus is living on the inside, you be strong in the Lord and the power of His might. You must have His strength. And strength of a spiritual kind. And that's of the Spirit of God lives inside of you. And such strength the Lord Himself has furnished you. You have His strength through the indwelling Holy Spirit, Jesus God, in you. He's the power of His might that is working in you and I. So how do you be strong in the Lord? I'm going to give you one that I'm going to have to close and we'll finish this up next week. So how do you be strong in the Lord? Not in your strength, but in God's strength. That's when one will put a thousand to flight and two will put 10,000 to flight. But how do you know if you do that in your own strength, it's hard to put one to flight. But when you do it in God's strength, there's 10,000 upon 10,000 that put to flight. Amen. That's when miracles, signs, and wonders begin to happen. <clears throat> so how do you be strong in the Lord? <clears throat> Ephesians 6 and 11 tells us. Put on 
you got something to put on daily. The whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Now the wiles of the devil again are thought projections. They're lies. They're like fiery arrows that shot into your mind, into your emotions. So put on the whole armor that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. That's how, that's the first step in being strong in the Lord. But I want to tell you what armor means here. And then we'll close out tonight. Putting on the armor. You know, and we envision, which is a good illustration of a Roman soldier's armor. But God is talking about putting on spiritual armor here. Armor is the Greek word panoplia. Panoplia. P-A-N-O-P-L-I-A. And listen to what it means. Panoplia means arms, weapons of righteousness, and light that prepare you for warfare. Now, where's the light at? <clears throat> the light's in you. It's right in you. So, are you prepared for, some say, spiritual warfare? Yes, but you have to put on. How do you put on? It's by your faith. And it's by you believing the word and speaking the word. Now, listen to this. Armor prepares you for warfare. These are spiritual weapons supplied by God, which is your armor. But you have to put them on. It's a mindset. It's your faith. Believed. And you see yourself as armed. That you know that your temple, your temple, your body is where God's spirit dwells. Jesus in you. God is alive in you. You are alive and well because God is in you. You have to put these on. They, they are supplied to you. You already have them inside of you. They're supplied for overcoming the temptations of the devil by arming yourself with the same mind as the mind of Christ. That's what it means to put on the armor of God. It's like not out of sight, out of mind. It's having the mind of Christ. And the Bible says that you have the mind of Christ. How do you access the mind of Christ? By the word of God in believing who God says you are and what you have. Did you get that? That is amazing to me. Absolutely amazing. See the Bible states that you have the mind of Christ. 1 Corinthians 2 and 16. Because you have the mind of Christ. How do you access his mind? You must change the way you've been thinking and access the mind of God in you by changing the way you've been thinking and speaking by renewing and cleansing your mind of negative stinking thinking with the Word of God. And when you connect with the Word, the Word will connect you. When you connect with the Word, the Word will connect you and it connects you in your thinking and action will follow. And that is faith with works. Amen. I'm going to stop right there. Hallelujah. Thank y'all for coming out tonight. And thank y'all for joining in tonight. And let's stand our feet. And uh, I'm going to ask Brother Gary Wakefield if he'll close us out tonight. And I hope to see you all on Resurrection Sunday morning. And, uh, you know, that's what we call Easter Sunday. Uh, it's also called our Passover. And I hope you're here. We're going to take communion uh, this coming Sunday right after worship. And I hope you're here. I hope to see the place filled up here on Easter Sunday morning. And uh, God bless you all. And Brother Gary, would you close us out tonight? Yes. Yes. Amen. Yes, Lord. Yes, amen. Yes, Lord. Amen. God bless you. See you on Resurrection Sunday morning.
Amen.